Good morning to you. This is the Preterist Power Hour, a podcast provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network. I thank you for, of course, for taking some time out of your day to uh, tune into what we like to call our Hour of Power, where we highlight uh, resources, announcements, studies, guests uh, in regards to the power of preterism. And uh, how I would highlight that is the advancement of preterism. Uh, that being said, I'm Mike Miano. I'm pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, director of the Power of Preterism Network. And it's my privilege to be here with my co-host. Those of you, of course, that join in with us, those of you that watch through Facebook, uh, thank you. you. You know, and I'm very grateful for uh, each of you and the desire and diligence you have uh, and being a part of these discussions. That being said, Edward, I'll go ahead and pass the time over to you. Encourage you to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and lead us in on a word of prayer. Amen. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member with the Power of Preterism Network. Um, it's always an honor and privilege to co host with Pastor Michael Miano. And uh, now I'd like to open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us and uh, open our eyes, ears, and minds and give us clarity and thought that we may present uh, Esther, the book of Esther, in a way that, you know, would give clarity for those listeners that we may glean from it, uh, discuss it, have dialogue with one another and fellowship with one another in these regards. And, you know, just talk about the Bible, you know, uh, with one another and that we may grow in, in, the, in the knowledge of God, you know, because this is what, you know, it's all about. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, I'm forgetting, I think it's Chag Purim Samyak is what I'm supposed to say to you today, which is the uh, greeting, of course, for the Feast of Purim. And uh, I'm excited because we're moving in on our second day of studying through the book of Esther. And I actually, in my study, uh, have now developed a different style. Yesterday, I mentioned to you different Bibles that I use and different methods that I'm using. What I began to do yesterday, being very much blessed by the resources provided by James Jordan and Cindy Coates, which again, we're pretty much building on saying the same thing, one uh, each other in different ways. Uh, however, if you remember uh, on our post, in regards to Ukraine, Russia, Gog, and Magog uh, on the Power of Preterism uh, blog site, uh, I had provided a list of details from Cindy Coates in regards to why Gog and Magog relates to what we read in the book of Esther. And what I had done was I went through that study by James Jordan and Cindy Coates notes, which again, you can find both at our blog. And I put together a sort of list a column list of the texts in Ezekiel that correlated to the texts in Esther. And what I've begun doing, uh, I opened up one Bible uh, to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and I opened up the other Bible, uh, both different translations, one with study notes, one without, and started writing my own study notes in the one without, my own correlations that I'm seeing as I'm studying and reading through the text myself. So I want to encourage everyone really, you know, it's very beneficial to have a couple different Bibles and a couple, couple different ways of reading through the text. Uh, it's been proven to be very beneficial in my study over the years. And I have a couple different Bibles that I've marked up. Uh, I think it was Charles Spurgeon. Here's your throwback Thursday. You knew I had to come with something. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, he said, uh, you know, if you look, and this is paraphrased, of course, uh, but if you look at a man whose Bible is all marked up and messed up, his life usually isn't. And, uh, you know, while again, I wish I could tell you I've attained perfection, uh, that is not the case. And I don't know anybody that knows me that would think that. Uh, however, um, I, I have attained perfection in Christ and I have attained uh, to really truly glorify God for everything uh, that has been provided, everything pertaining to life and godliness that is ours through Christ, again, uh, which demonstrates uh, that gives us the opportunity to see the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Uh, that being said, I do want to say one more thing. Um, you know, I hold to a, a Christ-centered reading of the Bible. Now, I don't do that to sound religious. I don't do that to sound more Christian than the next reading or anything to that effect. However, as I have come to understand the riches of Christ, I, when I read through the Bible and I study through the text, I so I, I see it. I see it so clearly because I believe, as what the text in New Testament says, that we have come to understand the mystery, the mystery of the ages. And I see these, these writers groping for, you know, what is the hope? Where is it? Where is our true hope found? You know, as you know, Edward, things can be seem good for a moment. Uh, then we all of a sudden find ourselves in lack. 
if you really have a true foundational hope, both of those circumstances are opportunities for you to rejoice and for you to grow. Uh, but if you have hope in, you know, that's something like sinking sand, then unfortunately, uh, you're going to go down with it. Whereas here we see in the story of Esther, uh, very much uh, this picture of Christ. I, I, I'm going to bring it out today. I'm going to show you. I think there's, as we had said, Esther is a historical text, but I believe it's also a prophetic text. It might even, dare I say, be a wisdom uh, literature. As we mentioned yesterday, it butts right up against Job, uh, which is another historical style um, prophetic text. A matter of fact, if I may bring this up that we mentioned yesterday, both Esther and Job share this court scene that uh, you know is often found in prophetic literature. So uh, these are just some details that should highlight for you um, interesting points to look at, at, not just a historical reading of Esther. And then, you know, some people just kind of throw the cliche, uh, which I'm guilty of myself, of just saying, you know, it's a story of hope, uh, how God saved the Jews and how saved the Jews. There's so much more to the text, as oftentimes is the case in good Bible study. So, Edward, anything you want to say before we dive into the text and uh, offer up some review? Sure. With my understanding that the Old Testament points to Christ Jesus and uh, and being Jesus is the fulfillment, you know, of the law and the prophets. So, you know, you, you should be able to find Jesus in throughout the Old Testament. That's know? right. That's right. You know, and I don't mean in an artificial way where, you know, again, uh, when I went to Bible college, I, I remember there was a textbook that it kind of frustrated me. It was a uh, a book where it went from like A to Z. It was almost like a kindergarten book. And it marked out, you know, where you can find Jesus in Genesis. And, you know, it would go through all these different verses and kind of force him in there. And I didn't necessarily disagree. I just, I warned people against proof texting. I, I as I study more and more, I, I think there's so much more to the text than ripping it out and placing it wherever we want. Uh, you, you know, there, there's a richness when you really understand it and dive in the way that the Jews do, you know, they, they, understand the narrative they they they, they mull upon it they, they think upon it they ponder and they're blessed thereby so uh you know i hope that that's what we cause people to do and uh that's what i, I believe the word of god is, is doing in our lives in our in in and through us as we study through scripture so hopefully we can see this through writing dividing the word yeah. that's right amen second timothy two fifteen. that's it um <laughs> So I, I, you know, I use that as like a cliche phrase. I often say, have you 2 Timothy 2.15 today? You know, uh, that's a, a way to encourage people in that regard. So Edward, let's jump into this here. Uh, so what would you be able to offer up a little bit of review as to what we read yesterday uh, in regards to Esther? Would you feel comfortable doing some of that? Sure. All right, share with us a little bit. Okay, basically what we had gotten from Esther is that the king... Um, um, had a banquet. Mm -hmm. He wanted to display the, his beautiful wife, you know, while the, you know because they he had given liberty for, for for the people to drink as much as they want and you know stuff like that to indulge as much as they like, and he wanted to display his beautiful wife, which she didn't want to uh, be put on display you know, under the circumstances. So she uh, refused the king. By disobeying his order, um, he, he felt basically embarrassed. So uh, he had went, I guess, to his leadership or, you know, his, you know, his, his, I guess, you know, the people that he has in leadership to uh, confirm to, you know, what should he do at, in this matter? And he was, uh, told that maybe he should, you know, kind of like put his wife away and get and, and seek uh, virgins and choose a virgin in, in the place of his wife, mm -hmm. which this is where Esther comes in. You know, uh, Mordecai hears about this and uh, I guess urges uh, her to, uh, I, I guess, to put it in layman's terms, to uh, see see if she qualifies, <laughs> which the king finds favor in her, chooses her. And then you have a gentleman, Haman, that gets authority by the king. And 
he has people pay homage to him, bow to him, and things like this. And Mordecai, being a Jew, would not do so. So Haman gets, you know, frustrated and coerces the king into making a decree to destroy all of the Jews. And then this is where we pick up with uh, Esther, you know. Right. Um, you, you know, I do want to highlight uh, as the result of all of that, the last verse we mentioned yesterday, uh, verse 15 of chapter three, it says the city of Susa was in confusion. So what we see here is just this whole confused society. Things are uh, not not very good. I wrote here in my notes, wicked rulers. This is what happens. One wicked ruler, uh, you know, Xerxes, Ahasuerus, uh, however you're, you're saying his name, there are different mm -hmm. translations say it different, uh, obviously gives power to Haman. Uh, one thing I will offer up in a little bit of further study, there are theories that uh, what Ahasuerus, Xerxes, uh, whatever, again, we're calling him, uh, what he was trying to have Vashti do was dance naked in front of uh, all these people. And again, mm -hmm. this is like they were carousing, you know, they were, they were, you know, there's, there's so many details here with Haman. Uh, what we're going to see is, uh, or I believe as we saw, uh, Haman kind of leaning in on the, uh, oh, well, no, we're going to see that today. Sorry. Uh, Haman leaning in on the couch, a very, you know, just not a very proper situation happening here. So Vashti just did not want to be put uh, in place in, in that type of way. Um, and then uh, we, so we talked a little bit about that yesterday. You mentioned the plot, and I think that's what's very important to, to note here. Uh, this plot that happens uh, that you, you notice in verse 22 of chapter two. Uh, the plot became known to Mordecai. He told Queen Esther and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. So what this becomes a, a theme here in this story, plotting. There's plotting, there's mystery. Uh, yesterday, matter of fact, I mentioned the word Hadassah. Uh, it represents the myrtle berry. And um, interestingly enough, Hadassah uh, would represent sweet and bitter. And Esther actually means hidden. So what we're seeing here is a sweet and bitter story uh, of something that's hidden and uh you know uh just it's such an interesting interesting prophetic picture if you will so uh what i wanted to highlight that gary demar brought out that when we read here in chapter 2 verse 22 this plot what we should be thinking further of is uh haman's plot right as we move further into chapter 4 and how this causes mourning for the jews all throughout the region so much so that they're throwing sackcloth and ash on themselves they're weeping in the streets and this is what we read about in Ezekiel 39, Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog situation, uh, interestingly enough, to allude back to what we had talked about last week, uh, what's happening there is because of their disobedience to the things of the Lord, the people of God, they, uh, they begin to think as though they, they begin to understand they're disgraced in the eyes of God, they're disfellowshipped, they're dead. To the things of God, and, and they're seeing his judgment and his hand upon them. Uh, specifically, I'm talking here about Ezekiel 39, verses 21 through 29. And uh, what you see is the Lord is about to do something in this, in the midst of this, that he is going, I don't want to, you know, we, we're not further enough in the story yet, but I want to let us know that this is the, the theme of this, this story. So the plot becomes this sort of picture of what Esther is getting at. Uh, it's, that's why, you know, you talk about Purim, a uh, Purim is the celebration of where the lot lie, uh, you know, where the lot lies, if you will. And uh, does it lie with Haman, the enemy of the people of God, the enemy of the Jews, or does it lie with the people of God, whom he has told he would be, God has told them he would be faithful to them again and again and again. So that's kind of the, the celebration of Purim is where we've seen God saving hand uh, yet again in a hidden, sweet and bitter way. Uh, you know, through the, the, the narrative of this time, through Esther's story, so. And we're going to get to a point where Mordecai gets, you know, gets favored by the king as a result of him say, uh, Esther, uh, Mordecai overhearing uh, Bethan and Tarsh, Teresh, two of the king's officials from the, those who guarded the door became angry and sought to attack the king. They were going to try to assassinate the king. And right. Mordecai overheard it, told Esther, and Esther told the king, save right. the king, they hung the two gentlemen. They hung the two. But we're going to see, you know, certain things with Haman and Mordecai uh, in the future reading. Right, yeah, you see it sets the table for you, in a sense. Yes, it sets um, the table, yes. So 
That being said, I just want to mention one more thing before we move in on uh, Esther chapter four, and that would be that we made this allusion yesterday and we highlighted it, that Haman, the name Haman, uh, where we first see it mentioned in, uh, what was it, uh, chapter three, verse one, uh, that uh, after these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him to establish his authority over all the princes. Uh, maybe that, I don't think that's the first mention. Maybe it was. Either way, uh, what so. we see then, I'm sorry? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't find, I can't see it anywhere else in the text. Either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, what we see next is uh, verse six in the same chapter of chapter three, uh, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of uh, Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. That's important to mention as well. And then, as I mentioned, the next verse talks about the lot. The name Haman, we see this mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Haman Gog. We also see the Agagite is uh, an Amalekite, and uh, these are the enemies of the people of God. So, Edward, as you had mentioned in our discussion about Gog and Magog, this phrase, this term is used in a variety of different ways to talk about the enemies of the people of God. And yeah. here we see it being used in Esther, highlighted in Esther, if you will. I notice every time it mentions Haman, it says the Agagite, the he who hated the Jews. You know, it's kind of like yeah. this, this uh, phrase, if you will. So um, I thought that was important to bring up and remind people to go back and look at the study and, and study it out. And you'll see the correlations yourself. We, again, have a blog dedicated to that entire study uh, where we've provided links and for further study from Gary DeMar, Dr. Don K. Preston, among others. Uh, so and may I add? Um, the two differences uh, with Gog uh, is is the name of an individual, and Magog is the name of an individual early, and then in, in Revelation that they're, they're just represented as enemies of of, of God. But right. he, although in the, it, with the names of Gog and Magog in, in in the earlier writings, they were enemies of God as well. You know, I think the uh, the lineage. The um. <laughs> God can make that. I haven't done the, we marked out those verses for everyone, so they could go back and look into that, but I don't know that it gives okay. us much detail about them. Right, right. However, Magog, now let's qualify that, Magog, I know <clears> that, I don't know about Gog, but Magog, uh, he's the beginning ancestor of the Amalekites. The Amalekites trace back to Magog, so uh, being thus the enemies of the people of God, being the people of the land, Perizzites, Hittites, as Derek Shoemaker mentioned the other day in our discussion. So, um, we, we see this all throughout the, uh, the scriptures. So uh, the, these people now, I think that's important because that's what I'm hoping that we'll glean from the, our study through Esther is we're going to see, oh, okay, so that's what the story is about. The whole Bible is about this, this beautiful picture that is celebrated throughout Esther. That's why it causes celebration, because this is the, a beautiful picture of what Israel was hoping for, desiring, and uh, we're going to see if it's complete. You know, and we'll talk about that as we go through our reading today. Amen. All right, cool. Well, here we are. We got, I have Esther chapter four on the screen. Uh, if you want to join me turning in your Bibles, uh, we have the NASB 2020 on the screen for you today. I know Edward uses that translation as well, and I'm using the NASB, I believe, 95 uh, or possibly older than that. But either way, we'll, we'll follow along. And I'm also using the NIV. Uh, two Bibles back to back, as I mentioned before, my new style of study here. So that being said, uh, let's go ahead and move in on our reading. Edward, you want to pick up the first uh, five verses? Sure. Esther learns of Haman's plot. When Mordecai uh, learned of everything that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. And he came as far as the king's gate, for no one was to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In each and every province where the command and decree of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, the fasting, weeping, and mourning rites. And many had sackcloth and ashes spread out as a bed. Then Esther's attendants and her eunuchs came and informed her, and the queen was seized by uh, by great fear. And she sent ga uh, garments to clothe Mordecai so that he would remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. Then Esther uh, summoned Hathak from the king's eunuchs, whom the king had 
appointed to attend her and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what his mourning was and why it was happening. Verse six. So Hactath went out to Mordecai in the city square in front of the city, the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him and the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasurer, treasuries for the elimination of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been issued in Susa for their annihilation so that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go into the king to implore his favor and plead with him for the, her people. So Hakthath came back and reported Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to Hakthath and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province uh, know that for many men and women who comes to the king in, in the inner courtyard who is not summoned, he has only one law, that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not yet summoned to come to, I, I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. And they reported Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, uh, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royal royalty for such a time as this. Yeah, that's right. Then that's right. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Oh man, for such a time as this, I know I got to continue through the text here. Verse 16, uh, go gather all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me and do not eat or drink for three days, night, uh, three days, night or day. And I, I and my attendants will fast in the same way. Then I will go into the king, which is not in accordance with the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and just did and did just as Esther had commanded him. So if I may, uh, what we notice here in this text is how sad the situation truly is. Uh, it is so much so it's caused great mourning among the Jews. That was verse two. Then uh, so much so that Mordecai will not accept condolences, uh, verse four. Uh, then you see here that Esther now and her attendants are all going to mourn just as much as uh, that th they will. And then it's a sad situation. You know, if I die, I die. Uh, you know, she's willing to take this chance, have courage and take this chance. So uh, that's obviously highlighted throughout the text. And why? Because of verse seven. This is all about the destruction of the Jews. Again, exactly what we read in uh, Gog and Magog, the Ezekiel 38 through 39 uh, text there about the destruction of God's people. And uh, what I also wanted to highlight in this text was uh, there's a messianic picture here in my estimation. In verse eight, I'll scroll back up here. As I read this, I, I couldn't help but think about Christ. It says, he gave him a copy of the text. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict, which had been issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show Esther and inform her and order her to go into the king and implore his favor and plead with him for her people. Now, in Hebrews chapter 5, I want you to read what it says there about Christ. And it, it just it reminds me so much of, of this text here, of what Esther's doing. She's, she's a messianic symbol, if you will. Uh, Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 9. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him. So, uh, well, I'm sorry, for the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So again, you have destruction, you have salvation. You have crying and tears and mourning, uh, one that is, you know, bringing forth death, one that has the power to bring forth death and destruction and a pleading against it. And, uh, you know, I just saw this, 
uh, and pleading with favor, you know, imploring for favor and pleading for the people. And that's what Christ brings favor. And he has brought salvation for the people. So uh, I just, I see a messianic picture happening right here. And again, if I can, I think the rabbis would point this out as well, that it's interesting that in the midst of men, wicked men that were, you know, living in their own idolatry, living in their own ego, uh, here comes forth a woman, a humble woman who uh, challenges them and, and, and obviously brings salvation, brings forth salvation for the people. Uh, I believe that would have said something in that time, says something in this time. May I even demonstrate Galatians chapter three, verses 28 through 29, right? In Christ, there's neither male nor female, nor, you know, uh, Scythian nor Jew, Gentile, etc. So again, we see this elimination of this, this, uh, this picture of vision where it's all man's kingdom and man's power. Edward, you going to say something? No, no. I, I was just using the word division. Uh, no more division. All right. Amen. Exactly. And again, in, in the Godhead, in, in the picture of in the Godhead, yes. come before and who can bring forth, you know, the truth of salvation and the message of God. So um, I just think that's a beautiful picture there, uh, you know, of salvation and of Christ. So, uh, and then of course, Lastly, I have to mention uh, what we mentioned yesterday in verse 14, uh, where, you know, for such a time as this, again, I believe that's a beautiful correlation to what we read in Galatians 4.4 4, uh, for, you know, the, in the fullness of time, uh, times per, God's perfect timing, uh, despite what man might be thinking or how dismal situation might be, God is sovereignly and providentially working uh, in their midst. So uh, Amen. that's what I think is going on here, prophetic illusion. Anything you want to share in regards to the chapter, Edward? No, I'm, I'm anxious to go to five. <laughs> uh, cool, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with five, and then you'll follow me? Yes. Okay, cool. I went too far. Here we go. Now, it came about on the third day that Esther, the third day, I want you to notice that one, by the way. I didn't notice that when I was reading the first time. Uh, those of you that have studied with me know we talk a lot about the third day in Jewish imagery there, in prophetic imagery. Uh, there was something that happened in sal salvific history on the third day, uh, just to remind everyone. So uh, now it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner courtyard of the king's palace in the front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. When the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the courtyard, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the top of the scepter. The king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom it shall be given to you. Esther said, if it pleases the king, may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther desires. So the king and Haman came to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. As they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, what is your request? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your wish? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. So Esther replied, my request and my wish is, if I have uh, found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my request and do what I wish, may the king and Haman come to the banquet which I prepared for them, uh, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. Then Haman went out that day joyfully pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate and that he had not, uh, he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Haman uh, controlled himself, however, and went to, went to his house, but he sent for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. Then Haman told them of the glory of his riches and his sons and every occasion on which the king had honored him and how he had been promoted, uh, how he had promoted him above the officials and servants of the king. Haman also said, even Esther, the queen, let no one except me come with to the king, to the, with, to the king, with the king to the banquet, excuse me, which she had prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her with the king. Yet all of this does not satisfy me. Every time I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting in the king's gate, then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, have a wooden gallows 50 cubits high made. And in the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. 
Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased Haman. So he had the wooden gallows made. <laughs> well, brother, if I may, first off, I have to tell you, I'm baffled by the third day reference. I didn't notice before. Uh, I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't studied out the significance of the third day in prophetic literature, now might be the time. Um, Edward, are you familiar with how I'm, I'm alluding to that? Well, Jesus being raised on the third day. Um, according uh, to the scriptures. Yes, according to the scriptures. What yes. scriptures? Uh, hmm. The uh, Synaptic Gospels? No, the book of Hosea. Oh, book of Hosea. Hosea talked about on the third day. Also, Jonah. If you remember, uh, Jesus yeah. said that just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, I will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So again, I want to encourage everyone. There's some prophetic significance the third day. I'll say this. What you see with the third day is a picture of transition. So let me tell you, folks, hold on, because here's your transition right here as you get into Esther chapter five. This is where we begin to see uh, there's about to be a change to this story, obviously. And uh, if I may show you uh, another significant thing that we mentioned yesterday is this uh, verse 11. I'll tell you, man, they just don't get it. Men just do not get it. If you notice what you see here in verse 11, then Haman told them of the glory of his riches and his many sons and every occasion on which the king had honored him and how much he promoted him above all the officials and servants of the king. This is what you read about, about King Xerxes, Ahasuerus in chapter one, Esther chapter one, if you remember, they're all just glorying in the kingdom, glorying what they have. And then, excuse me, as I mentioned yesterday, this is what you see in Hezekiah. Uh, when yeah. you get to the end of Chronicles, what does he do? He, he, he welcomes Babylon and, hey, you know what, guys? Come look at all my riches. Look at me. Let me boast in my riches. Matter of fact, to carry that forward, I believe that that's what David was doing. That's why David was not on the front of battle with his soldiers, with Uriah in battle. What was David doing? Sitting at home, lounging, glorying in, in all of his riches rather than being the man that he was called to be. So that's what you're seeing here. Another allusion to this, this way that these wicked men run their empire and every time you see that, you're going to see devastation. Amen. And something, yeah, look, uh, the, 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 the city of Susa was in confusion, as I marked out before uh, in the earlier chapters. And then here you have, we're, we're going to see, obviously, where this is going to lead Haman uh, in his, his ego. And, and the uh, greatest sin that God hates is pride. That's right. Amen. And, and you know, it, that's, that's right. That's, that, that's what you're seeing again and again in Scripture, is what man's ego can cause again that's the, if that's not the entire biblical narrative uh with the wickedness of man and and god's ultimate way of undoing that which is to cause us to you know set our eyes on jesus as author and finisher of our faith so uh that being said uh, one thing i did want to highlight here is in verse 14 this is something else we highlighted yesterday uh we talk about there's a uh, there's a favor in the multitude of counselor counselors right we see that in the book of proverbs that's wisdom uh, but then there's also uh let's say the lack of favor in the multitude of fools uh, you know, that's also a proverb. And uh, what you see here is th these men, these kingdoms have a multitude of fools around them. Ahasuerus with his guys telling them, you know, hey, do this, send this, this uh, edict throughout the land. Uh, then you have here, notice his wife and all of his friends are the ones who tell him to build this gallow. Notice that because it's going to become significant. Be careful the advice you listen to, because you'll see what these people immediately do when, uh, you know, push comes to shove, to use that phrase, uh, you, you know, when they, when things really hit the, what's the, uh, there's a popular phrase when uh, boots, push not, push to down. not push come to shove, uh, there's another, either way, um, you know, the nitty gritty, so to speak, there's something I'm looking for in that yeah. extent, but either way, when, you know, really, when it gets down to it, that's, that's what I'm going to say. So you'll notice what happens with that advice. Um, so Edward, anything you want to say in regards to chapter five? Well, there's, there's a quote that people say that um, when you when you get advice from uneducated people, a lot of uneducated people, that doesn't make you educated. That's right. Yeah, you're just regurgitating. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Regurgitating garbage. Um, yeah. All right, so now something I did want to highlight right away as we, we get into chapter six. During that night, the king could not sleep. So he gave an order to bring the book of records, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Now, uh, this is important because 
some people, when they read earlier, if you, you noticed, uh, I talked about in chapter two, verse 23, it said, have this written in the book of Chronicles. And yes. many people think that's talking about the book of Chronicles of the Bible. No, every king had Chronicles. So there's two things we're going to note about this. Um, the first thing is, if you notice, this king could not sleep during the night. That's what happened here. He could not sleep during the night. And he, due to his not sleep during the night, he has his Chronicles brought out before him, you know, his way of the kingdom. This, in my estimation, contrasts the uh, way in the Old Testament where, uh, I mean, the way where we see with the people of Israel, where God speaks to them in dreams. It's not that they can't sleep and they have to have some books read to them. God mm -hmm. speaks to them in dreams. So you notice the two different ways that uh, this is happening in the Persian Empire. Uh, they worship gods and, you know, false gods. So they lean upon their own understanding. Their way of comfort is not God speaking to them in God's word. It's they're leaning on their own understanding, their own history, their own culture, and gaining wisdom in that way. The second thing I want to highlight is the story is going to change here. Uh, that You know, that he's going to he's going to reflect upon something and it's going to change. And the reason why I bring that up is because that highlights the importance of note keeping. You're going to see what happens here because he kept notes because he kept Chronicles. This is something we find all throughout the Bible Kings. Uh, we're called to be Kings and priests in the kingdom of God. Kings kept notes. It's that simple. There's your, your exhortation to keep notes. I'm actually writing a book about kingdom Kings later this year. And that's actually an entire chapter is on note keeping. Uh, how that has to be something that you have to do. Uh, you have to keep notes. So this, this is my exhortation, if you will, from uh, Esther chapter six, verse one. So hopefully we'll keep notes like the, like the kings of the, the Jewish kings. That's how right. They would uh, write down scripture, write, write the Bible. I, is it the whole Bible that they ha would have to dictate? That's right. Yeah, they would write down the uh, entire law of Moses. Oh, the entire All law five books. Uh, there's yeah. a good reason for you to be, uh, besides note keeping, there's a good reason for you to join me in my Lent reading. Uh, if you go to the Blue Point Bible Church, we actually have a Lent reading there. You can read through the entire law of Moses uh, for the season of Lent. We're, kind of, we're currently getting in on Exodus, so uh, you, you have a little bit of time to catch up, but uh, there's your reading. Uh, by the way, I'm noticing we're up against the time, and I do have another program that I have to be a part of. Uh, therefore, I'm going to bring us to a close, and the good news is we're going to continue tomorrow. Uh, into the book of Esther. And of course, uh, I didn't bring up too many Throwback Thursday resources. However, I'm very excited for tomorrow because we have Flashback Friday. So I get to provide resources and thoughts. I have a bunch to share. And then of course, uh, I get to provide some great announcements moving forward. I did wanna let everyone know, uh, as you may have already noticed, Dr. Don K. Preston has provided the announcement that the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend will be completely online this year, uh, will not be happening in person. Uh, I'm off the top of my head, I'm forgetting the theme right now. However, uh, I'll be providing that information uh, for everyone tomorrow. So I uh, thank you for being a part of the Preterist Power Hour. Edward, any last thoughts before we go ahead and close out? Thank you for having me and giving me clarity. <laughs> Amen. You thank you. Hey, thank you, brother. Thank you for being here. Again, as I mentioned in my opening, I, I appreciate your desire and diligence. And uh, tomorrow we'll pick up here with Esther chapter six. And uh, again, Purim, uh, the Purim, Purim, however you choose to pronounce it, uh, is actually a two-day celebration. So let us uh, move forward, continuing to rejoice in the victory of God that Cindy Coates had uh, mentioned to us a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking about you know the, the season of Purim and how it represents the victory of God. May that, may that be your exhortation today to go and look up some verses, take some notes, find your testimony in regards to the victory of God in your life. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the, the victory you've provided. As your word tells us, Lord, uh, we've been provided with everything pertaining to life and godliness. This is through the knowledge of you, Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we have been uh, blessed by so that we might be this body that identifies with you, Lord. Uh, again, a great uh, reading we see there in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, Lord, exhort us uh, in the spirit, Lord, to move forward and to really glean this, this picture here from Esther, uh, her courage. Uh, what you can do in the midst of dismal situations, what you are doing, not what you can do, Lord, but what you're ultimately doing uh, ultimately at all times, even when we cannot see you, uh, when, when things seem dark. Uh, Lord, be our light. Thank you for being our light. Thank you for providing everything to us that we need and desire. And we ask that you continue to build us up and edify us as we go through the text. Uh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. God bless.
Thank you. God bless.